Hello. Hi. <laughs> we're Evolution Grad Girls and we're indoors. Yeah, coming at you from our living rooms. <laughs> We can't see each other anymore, unfortunately, and we can't go anywhere anymore. So we're gonna have to come from our our lovely homes, our lovely living rooms and couches to answer your questions that are just pressing despite the dumpster fire that our earth is currently. <laughs> um, so today we're gonna do some basics, some basics about like human evolution, just some questions that kind of broadly address um, human evolution or evolution in general, or just, you know, any of these concepts that seem like something people should need to know first. So okay. with, on that note, I'll start, Gaudi. Um, okay. My name's Kristen. I'm interested in archaeology. I'm interested in how we ever became to use tools. Um, why would we use tools? It seems like plenty of other animals are successful and live happy lives without tools. I know my two cats have no tools of their own and they seem very happy with their lives and successful as a species. Um, so what's the deal with tools? And does that make us really different? Yeah. And then again, I'm Audrey. I'm interested in genetics, um, what genes we might have gotten from our closest related cousins, um, you know, the Neanderthals, other hominins. Um, how have they been like incorporated into modern day populations, what changes that they cause in us, what adaptations do we have from them? Yeah, overall, what do we have that's not necessarily us in our genes? Yeah. And on that note, let's get down to the basics. So our first question is a question I find near and dear to my heart, and I will read word for word. <laughs> This is from r slash explain it like I'm five. Um, and the question is, why are skulls thousands of years old that get found still have teeth in them, but my teeth rot out easily from my skull and I have an immune system and those skulls sit in dirty. In dirty. In dirty. They're so right. We, found, we find lots of skulls and teeth that are in some essence sitting in dirty that do not have the same, you know, issues that people have when teeth sit in face. Um, and my, you know, my short answer is, you know, skulls, especially teeth, um, are usually the best preserved remains um, at all, right? Like if you think about it, uh, um, your, your head or your skull, your cranium is round-ish and kind of like aerodynamic in a sense. Yeah. So it, it, it falls and tumbles into the water. It tumbles rather peacefully. Um, if it rolls around, it rolls around the landscape very peacefully. And teeth themselves, some people say, are basically rocks. So teeth can erode and have problems in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, if you don't brush your teeth, they will rot out. But there's one thing that's different in your face than it is in dirty, which is the environment. Um, and that's sugar. So we brush our teeth because we intake a lot of sugar and take a lot of different chemicals that the natural environment doesn't necessarily interact with. So rotting teeth out doesn't really matter if you're not eating anything. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is chemicals that are in dirty, not same as in mouth. So yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but um, that's why we don't find, you know, rotting teeth and dirty. Yeah. I'd also like to add with like moisture. So we need water to live, but so do all those bacteria and everything else that lives in your mouth. Um, when you have skulls just like sitting on the dirt in a lot of places where we find them in Africa, it's like it's dry, arid regions. There's not a lot of water around. Those bacteria have died off. They can't do all of the rotting digestive processes that are going on in your mouth all the time. Um, so even just the loss of moisture, the loss of water allows for your teeth to be able to preserve. Yeah. It's kind of like how, you know, if you get dried shiitake mushrooms, they last longer than if they were mm -hmm. wet or <laughs> undried. They were super moist. Um, so there you go. Skull sitting dirty, not so bad. Um, another one, this is from the r slash evolution. So our, our main interest, 
What exactly determines the point in evolution when an organism is considered its own species? Um, and this is something that I like kind of like get weirded about, um, in my coursework as well. Like when I first started taking coursework, I was like, everything is arbitrary. Time isn't real. Why do we even do any of this? If we don't have like a real rule book for this. Um, but, uh, now that I know better, right. Um, my thoughts are, you know, it is reasonable to consider the transition to modern homo sapiens, right? Like, you know, people are concerned about, you know, are Neanderthal and homo sapien, you know, how do we know they're not the same? How do we know they're not, um, <clears throat> they're not different? Like what, what are, what are our arguments? You know, if a species is something that can't, uh, if a species is something that can procreate successfully with another member of a species, then how can we exist and have all this, um, all the, the DNA is not ours. Um, this is laundry interest. Um, <laughs> so the definition of a species is kind of different depending on the purpose that you're interested in talking about it. So like, for me, um, as an archaeologist, the definition of a species isn't necessarily maybe that important, right? I just know that some some creature, some later date and time is doing something, and it's more like labeling purposes, right? Um, for me, like, Paranthropus boisei is interesting, but I don't really necessarily need to know that it can't procreate with um, an Australopith, even though I'm pretty sure they didn't. But I didn't know, I don't necessarily care if they do or not, as long as you know, I can identify who's making the tools, right? For me, it doesn't matter. Um, geneticists uh, will be doing it in a very different way. So like if the DNA is dissimilar enough, then they're, they're not the same species. Um, paleontologists, we don't have DNA for a lot of these older specimens and things, and it, they may have the same outlook for me. You know, a species is just something that's so dissimilar and their bones and morphology that, you know, it's just different and we decided it. Um, zoologist even asks a different question, right? So, um, when you're doing work in a zoo, like it's still not the same as a geneticist. It's just a different question, different answer. Um, but in terms of the homo sapien, um, homo neanderthalans, this debate of like, are we the same? Are we different? Um, the, in this post, there was a question about a transition species, um, which is real, right? We do see technically transition species that could be an intermediate between, um, it's more derived form and it's more primitive form. Um, so technically it's very possible that there is some, um, some transition element between Homo sapien and Homo neanderthalensis. But, you know, at this point we may not have found that, that individual or that group yet. So at this point we can, we count them separate species and we just haven't found enough data to support any other hypothesis. Yeah. And I think just like, to reiterate, even in when we're not talking about fossil organisms, like today's organisms, you know, it's so difficult to decide what is a species. Because you might say genetically they look like very different, <clears throat> um, but maybe there's some point where they can actually hybridize. So if you're using the biological species concept where you're saying like if they're two species, they can't breed with each other, but then somehow they can hybridize and those hybrids may or may not be able to breed with one of the parent groups then does that mean those two are no longer species? Yeah. So there's still a lot of confusion. A lot of, uh, yeah, there's no real consensus, I think, in biology. With yeah. That question. Not yet. No, no one's really agreed upon some <laughs> one and done definition, um, which is confusing and sometimes helpful, right? Mm -hmm. um, another question on r slash evolution, is evolution completely random, right? Like... Things go in the environment, shit happens. Um, whatever comes out is what comes out and then they move on. Is what I tell people is like, hey, I study how <laughs> stuff have sex and die and what comes after that. <laughs> very like very vaguely, whoever survived the whatever's going on in the environment. Um, so this person in our slash evolution. <laughs> my therapist tells me, Oh, you should be thinking of this this pandemic in in like a an adaptive sense. And I was like, Oh God, please not, not from the way that I adapt, adaptive, like, no, not that. And I was like, Marin, like in my mind, you have sex and you die. And that's all your legacy is like, whatever else come after you. I don't want to think about that in this pandemic. For some animals, for some plants, that's all it is. Hey, Make might, as, might as well be us that for us too. Why not? <laughs> 
Um, but this question asks, you know, I've been told there are a lot of random genetic mutations that aren't caused by anything and aren't really meant to happen. Um, this affects natural selection, right? But if natural selection takes its course and organism with advantageous mutations live and disadvantageous organisms die off, that wasn't really a question. Um, so my, my two cents about that is, you know, some parts of evolution are random and some aren't, right? Um, if you have copy number variant stuff, that sure can be, that can be random. Um, things in your environment can be random, like, you know, radiation poisoning in Chernobyl, that could be random. Like mm -hmm. that's not something that natural selection selected for, but then you also have things that are selected for with natural selection and sexual selection. So, um, technically no, not everything in, in evolution is random, but there is some element of randomness at all times, right? We have mm -hmm. genetic mutations, we have environmental stressors, we have um, maybe even interpersonal stressors that are yeah. it acting on um, the essence of our being, our genes. Um, that so can't, really, really, the, can't the really conditions do. surrounding yeah. evolution are the terms and conditions, not the process. Evolution. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so no, evolution is not, you know, random at all parts, but there are a lot of unpredictable and random um, portions of it that we have yet to really like understand fully. I mean, or maybe we understand them fully, but we can't explain them. Um, so Audrey, I'll take, I'll give it off to you to answer some. Right. So this next question is regarding DNA repair uh, versus evolution. Give me a second. I gotta open it up. So, it's kind of a long question, um, but let me just summarize it. So this person is asking, uh, this is from r slash evolution, um, that perfect DNA repair would obviously preclude evolution, um, leading to the eventual extinction of any germline whose niche disappears. Um, so some niches, like lower bathopelagic zones, which I, if I remember correctly, would be like the deepest parts of the ocean. Um, they might exhibit only limited physical changes for eons. Um, but in other places, other new species will arise that might alter the balance of the niches that are occurring in that environment. So this person's asking if anyone has looked at a link between environmental stability and the efficacy of DNA repair mechanisms, and wondering if we could investigate clades that have seemingly stayed the same for a long time, like sharks and coelacanths, which are a super cool fish. So if you guys have heard of them for a long time, we thought they had gone extinct. And then in like the early 1900s, they found new specimens of coelacanths. And now I think there's thought to be three different species. Um, of still extant coelacanths. Uh, so if we could investigate these specimens, these lineages to determine uh, how they ward off mutations or if we do. So my question there kind of has like a little bit of a misconception. Like coelacanths are evolving, right? They might not look as different from their ancestors as like we might. Um, but that doesn't mean they haven't changed genetically at all. There must still be mutations that are accumulating um, in their genomes. And we're seeing like the end result, right? So we're not seeing what came in between. And I don't know how many fossil coelacanths have been found from like in between periods. They live in the middle of the ocean, so it's a little bit difficult. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they are evolving, right? They are going through mutation and it's possible whatever deleterious mutations that they had, those lineages just died out. Um, and what we have are the coelacanths today. So yeah. there is no such thing as DNA repair. Our, our mutations happen, they happen randomly. Just last question asked, they're like part one of the conditions for evolution. Um, and another thing to point out, too, is that a lot of species, um, they don't fit into just one very specific niche, right? Like, we're generalists. Humans can eat plants. We can eat animals. We can fit multiple different niches. Um, and it's the same thing with a lot of different kinds of organisms. So for these ones that might not have changed a lot, it could partially be, like, the stability of their environment, but maybe also that they just happen to be relatively plastic organisms, relatively able to 
occupy part of several niches? That's a great answer, Audrey. Um, <laughs> something I want to add to that is like, um, I went over, I went to the summer over the summer I went to Toronto and I um, visited a pal and we went to the the aquarium right like you know we got to go do something fun um, and there's there's a whole like part where you can touch horseshoe crabs and things which I'm like always kind of weirded out by like I don't really necessarily feel like it's my place in nature to like mess with horseshoe crabs I'm just like nah I don't want to touch them uh, that's none of my human species business to be touching those sweet angels um, but you know, the whole concept behind the exhibit was that horseshoe crabs are living fossils. And I don't like that term because it's not real. There's nothing, you know, theoretically, it's fun to think that they're, you know, and if you think of a living fossil, you think, okay, there's a dinosaur bones that are just like dancing and having a great time. Sure. But like mm -hmm. the real, the real definition of a living fossil or the it's not really a real definition because I guess it's not really a real thing, but the definition of a living fossil is something that has not changed over time. For instance, like coelacanth, horseshoe crabs, and then there's like a couple other ones that I can never remember because I'm just way more interested in coelacanths than horseshoe crabs. Um, but this is not real. Like these, these creatures are going through natural selection, sexual selection, all kinds of pressures at all points in time. Mm -hmm. They may look relatively very similar, um, to their fossil, the fossil record and their ancestors, but they do have visible differences in not only, you know, genetically we can see that they're different, but they also have visible differences in like just the way they look. Like if you can, if you Google like living fossil horseshoe crab, like there's plenty of videos that really well disprove that, um, living fossils are not really real. Um, and I think that's one, that's something that I think a lot of people use against um evolution that evolution isn't real because how can these things be the same over time mm -hmm. but they are not the same over time so that's not really a valid um term a valid argument really anything so i would be wary of like i'd be wary of saying you know like living fossil or that coelacanths haven't changed over time because they definitely have right they just mm -hmm. are very well successful to their environment and may not be pressured to be much different than they were many moons ago. You know, alligators are a great example as well. Like mm -hmm. alligators are very successful in their environments. Um, and they probably have not changed much since the dinosaur days. Um, that's what my mom says at the very least. Um, so yeah, I would, I'd be careful of like mixing up these things and the whole evolution game because you know, it's still happening. It's just maybe not that alligators all turned, you know, like a square or something crazy because that they just didn't need to. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> well, then that brings us to our next question here. Um, so this question on r slash ask anthropology um, is asking how many generations does it take for a genetic trait, uh, parentheses, like a specific talent to be established? So as an example, this person says, if we train a child in some random game that calls for abstract thinking, and let's say we train that child from kindergarten to adulthood and they become a grand master of that game just from continuous training, learning and improvement. Then we breed that person with someone who is untrained in the game. How many generations would it take for there to be statistically significant change in, offspring, in the offspring's abstract thinking skills and the ability to play that game? And would it occur faster if you had two grand master parents? Right. So I'm always wary of the ones where it's like, can we do things to children and animals that that don't necessarily benefit children or animals? Yeah, I also just think that the word breed here is just a little iffy. Yeah. Um, like you're only more than you're, that. you're only looking and your whole your sole purpose in life is to create a grandmaster child at a specific <laughs> game, which could be not period. exactly an exhilarating game either. <laughs> Right. So I think another kind of misconception here is that you can train a talent um, that can be passed on genetically to your offspring, which it's not possible. Like if I played piano since I was five and became like a grandmaster at piano um, and then married and had children with someone who was also like a master in piano that doesn't mean our ch child is going to be automatically born with like piano mastery 
right so these skills are like cultural they're like things you learn over time and they can't be passed on there could be like cultural transmission whereas like yes if you had a parent or two parents that were already piano masters is that child more likely to be better at piano sure because he's getting teaching from a young age um, but it's not anything with a genetic component and I feel like the closest thing this person could be talking about would be epigenetics where sometimes something that happens in a person's life can be passed on. It can cause a change to your genes. It could like shut off a gene um, or change some kind of aspect of regulation. And then the baby ends up <clears throat> uh, having some kind of a phenotypic effect because of that. Right? So like our teacher likes to bring up um, the Dutch hunger winter a lot. Or like these women who were starving when they had babies that led to more obesity in um, populations further along because the babies developed, I think what they usually call like the thrifty um, phenotype where they want to, their bodies want to hold on to as much fat, as much food as possible because when they were developing, they were developing in a really like nutrient deprived environment. So like that's really um, the closest thing to this. But again, that still has a genetic basis. It's not just yeah. something a talent. Yeah, you can't really... It's definitely not the same thing, but it is possible where you're, you're having these changes, just not in grandmaster uh, situation. <laughs> okay. I wish um, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I mean, I can play piano. I have plenty of like musical talents, but my spouse is not going to get like, not going to <laughs> contribute anything to that. And our <laughs> child is not going to get anything either. You know, even if the parents are both very talented, that only, that only means they know how to teach somebody something, not that mm -hmm. their genes instruct the child to be any different. So yeah. um, I'd be really wary when you meet someone who has a lot of talents and you want to have sex and procreate with them just because they have interesting skills. So it's not going to work. Dump him, dump her, maybe even. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not going to come to fruition like you think. And then you're going to be stuck with a lot of responsibilities and be ready this morning. So maybe find, maybe find a better um, purpose to procreate with someone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so if evolution is a is the fact, the fact, and natural selection is the theory, then to what extent is evolution itself considered a fact? Um, and this is interesting because this is just like, what do words mean really? Um, mm -hmm. Not really like an evolution question, I guess, but this is on r slash <clears throat> evolution. And unfortunately, this person deleted their username, so I hope nobody gave them too much shit for this um, because it is a reasonable question to me. Um, so, you know, Darwin has a theory of evolution, right? But it, evolution as a process is a fact and is proven to be true and it is replicable. So it's not like evolution happened once and it will never happen again. That doesn't make, that's not a fact. Um, while natural selection is the system of ideas that proves why evolution works. So evolution is a fact, which is the concept that things change over time due to pressures natural selection is a pressure that causes things to change over time. Um, so evolution is a concept. Natural selection is just an explanation of how it works. So, um, and, and like, also there are plenty of other things that affect evolution. So, you know, and someday natural selection could be a fact, right? I mean, we can see that things select in a certain way, but you know, that's not the only explanation for evolution. There's sexual selection, there's environmental things, you know, mm -hmm who knows when, what will happen when my skull sits in dirty. Um, but you know, there's, there's plenty of explanations to why this happens. And, um, so evolution is a fact and natural selection just supports it. Um, and then another question very much in the same vein of it. And someone is vacuuming outside my apartment. <laughs> Love that. Um, another R slash evolution question is how does evolution work? Um, which, is a fine and dandy question to me. The sub question, which is often a phenomenon in the, in all of these questions is I have a main question and I have a sub question. There's a lot of details that don't exactly like ask something. It's sometimes kind of hard to flesh out what's occurring. Um, but we do it for the fans, which is maybe one person so far. Um, but what determines a species to evolve? Is it environmental changes or DNA constantly being mixed into the child by its parents? Um, 
I'd be really careful to say that it's constantly being mixed into the child by its parents. You know, they get a one and done shot, I think, at making the child and then it's out and then you don't really contribute any genes to it any further. Um, you can have more children, um, but it's not the same child getting different genes from its um, parents. Um, so evolution works really all the time. And you can very much in a very short sense, that's less morbid than the one that I tell my therapists in the evenings is in short, evolution is descent with modification. So I procreate and I have asthma. Um, my child could have asthma if my spouse has it, or if asthma no longer exists because it's a, everyone with asthma dies and it's not a worthwhile trait, then asthma is no longer available. There are things that in evolution that are advantageous and disadvantageous. So my asthma is not a good thing, but I have really good eyesight. So it's not a perfect system where we delete all the bad stuff and we conserve all the good stuff. Um, I can simultaneously have great eyesight and horrible lungs um, and still survive and have sex and move on. And as long as I have sex and my kid is somewhat viable and taken care of, for, my legacy is done. You know, it's it's not like a... It's not really even that complicated, I guess. Place yeah, exactly. I feel like a lot of people always question, they're like, well, if this disease like kills us, why do we still have it, right? If you get it after hey, your you're childbearing a- age, <laughs> and if you've already had offspring by, that, by the point that it starts to become deadly, then it gets passed on. Yeah, why yeah exactly you what you said. Like, well, the disease is just really good. Yeah. <laughs> really bad it's just that the disease is really doing a great job of, of evolving in its environment and being successful mm-hmm. so like people people don't often think of um not so anthropogenic things undergoing an evolution as, as well so like you know bacteria whatever diseases viruses whatever like covid is a a great example of something that's very successful that is still very detrimental mm-hmm. so like i yeah, you know, you can see that play out in a lifetime. And another thing that I think is so interesting is like Peter and Rosemary Grant's work on Darwin's finches in the same the same very island. They've lived there for like, well, not maybe not lived, but might as well have lived there for like 30 years. And they can they've laid out everything for us. Like they can observe everything in uh, like happening in front of them in a very small secluded island. And they have such great record of like really awesome hybridization events like beak changes like go look up the big bird lineage like that's just one really awesome cute little example of like things happen quick and it's not always from good circumstances or they don't always have the best outcomes and yeah i I would definitely want to say like evolution's not perfect it's whatever works for the moment Mm -hmm. and like whatever works to keep things going is it's not like you know insert and delete type of deal Mm -hmm. So then that kind of brings us to our next question here. Um, Can complex life evolve from simple life while complex life already exists? This person posted on r slash evolution and they're asking if they define simple life as a single cell organism and complex life as something, say like a fish. Um, Can something that goes from thriving in an environment like today eventually evolve to a complex organism like something with a nervous system? And the answer is, could it? Yes, it's absolutely possible. Um, And I didn't actually know too much about this, so I did some reading last night. (laughs) Um, And I found that there actually have been several instances where multicellularity evolved. So it didn't just happen one time in the history of evolution. We all like came from that one multicellular organism. Um, One of the examples I found was like kelp, like seaweed. You guys have ever seen like those kelp forests like in San Francisco and um, those really tall like brown kelp. Apparently brown kelp evolved multicellularity differently from like other grasses. Um, so yes, it is possible, but we also have to think about in terms of like time scale ecology wise, um, what are the niches still available in the environment? Right? Like if something wanted to evolve into a new niche, it's possible, but if there's already a lot of life present in the environment and they're occupying all the available niches, that organism is going to have to come up with something really novel, really new to either make a new niche for itself or fill something that none of these other organisms are fulfilling. Otherwise, it's already kind of being outcompeted as it 
begins its life. I want to, I want to add, this is like something I also did in the very last minute that was not for this project. It was for my job. Um, so I, I looked into like, you know, what are, what are some data we can use for data science themed in activities? Sure. Um, that's human evolution. And I read this paper that was like, our earliest hominids are likely a weed species that we, we came into something it, it contributed some kind of novel situation where we were able to kind of like ruin other other hominoids situation on earth and that's why we're so unique right um so i thought that was very interesting is like you know people think of us as like or you know our genus in general is like so awesome so great but like we once were not the top of the food chain or the top of anything really. And that we likely could have just been like any of these smaller, not, well, these are obviously multicellular organisms that are very complex, but we could be in that similar situation where, um, we were the underdog at one point and it just kind of flushed everybody out of an, uh, the habitat. So I think, um, that's a fun thing to think about. Um, when thinking about, you know, complex life, simple life, you know, that doesn't complex and simple don't always mean good and bad. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of simple life that's doing just fine with the COVID thing, <laughs> but a lot of complex life is not doing great. Yeah, exactly. There's like some simple life that like they can live around volcanoes and around yeah. like sulfur springs and be totally fine. They don't have depression. They don't have to pay rent. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised. They're very they colorful. They They're very live. pretty. They're gorgeous. Um, yeah. <laughs> they might have free will. Who's to say? I don't know. And honestly, even like this is of a hypothetical question too, as well, yeah. right? Like it's not something that we'd really be able to see on a short time scale um, nowadays. Anyway, we wouldn't really be able to see a bacteria slowly evolving into a fish. Yeah. All right. So our next question, also from r slash evolution, um, is asking what key additional findings have been discovered after Darwin in reference to evolution? Right. So, of course, Darwin, master of his field, gave us such a basis for studying biology. Um, but there's been a lot discovered since his time. There's a lot Darwin didn't know. Um, and one of them also mentioned here in one of the top comments is just DNA genetics, like even the word genetics. Um, nobody was studying DNA in Darwin's time. Didn't know what DNA looked like. We didn't know about alleles. Um, like, what are we getting from each parent? So Darwin, I don't know if he knew this either, Kristen, but he used to have this idea of gemules. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. So he thought that, like, when people had offspring, little gemules from, like, the different cells and parts of their body would all come together and join up with, the, like, the little egg or the little sperm, um, and then those would come together to make the new organism, which isn't really how it works. We're not getting little parts of each of our cells traveling down a, to our eggs. It is a little like human person in like a little <laughs> droplet. That's, that's the next program, a uh, Halloween party costume is me in like a super <laughs> droplet. <laughs> like a lot of people thought. That's incredible. Um, and like, you know, Darwin didn't even, Darwin is, is someone we can credit for natural selection, not necessarily evolution itself. Mm -hmm. right. There's also like, um, in terms of more genetics, I guess, like the idea of epigenetics, right, which is still, like, especially in paleoanthropology and anthropology, is like a newer field. Um, but Darwin definitely did not know about epigenetics, like the changes that could happen not to our DNA sequences, but just to how they're regulated, how we express them, and how the environment around us, like having some different chemicals like EPAs um, in our environment can affect us, can affect babies. Um, and I guess more paleoanthropologically speaking, yeah. we didn't really know about all of these possible hominid ancestors, right? Most of them started being discovered in like the 1900s. Yeah. With the exception of, I think the Neanderthal discovered pretty. Yeah. I think that was in like the late 1800s, right. but who's to say. Darwin they, never knew about philanthropists that... and Australopith yeah. and Sahelanthropus. And, and we don't even know the full picture. Yeah. So, you know, it's a good question to ask, you know, what, what's up with the life after Darwin? You know, how do we, what do we know since then? But there's so much more to know after we're one and done with this life. Like, 
our our greatest works are going to be nothing in comparison to what some people may find in the future. Yeah. Um, and then we have a joint question that we want to talk about. Um, someone said, shouldn't we be saying natural preservation instead of natural selection? Um, so this person said it's common knowledge that Darwin, R slash evolution, sorry. It's common knowledge that Darwin said he would use the term natural preservation over natural selection. If he could start again, um, because wait, if, if he could start again, proposing these concepts, sorry. Um, he said the latter sounds like a conscious directed purpose. So, um, I, I see what you're saying, like, um, conservation, and you know, selection do sound like purposeful. I am selecting that my spouse is a very great pianist because I can play piano and we're gonna have great children that are very talented. Um, but you know, I, I don't necessarily know that a lot of people really think that any of this is really um, directed consciously. Um, so I can definitely see what you're saying, right? Like, but at the same time, to me, I personally, I feel like those two kind of sound s similar enough to where it does the job. Yeah, I don't know. If, like, I guess I, I do understand that like words matter, and you know, with like connotation, I guess some people might see selection as like the work of like oh, I'm going to select for this specific appearance, and that appearance is going to be better in this environment. Um, but yeah, like Kristen was saying, I think here. Preservation and selection to me don't have too much of a difference either. And the way that this person is um, kind of explaining what they think to me, it kind of seems like the same thing. Um, yeah, I think um, they say um, a really good way to think of natural preservation as I'm describing it is that he, it's like a bouncer for genes. Um, all the genetics have to walk up to the gate, so to speak. The bouncer doesn't create the, the genes, but they just decide what gets passed. And I was like, you know, that isn't necessarily any true. That's either. still selection. Yeah. Because you have to select. The bouncer is not really deserving any genes. He's choosing who gets to come into the club. Yeah. 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 Or it, it would Again, be one thing if you were, if you're preserving the people who are currently in the club, if you're keeping them in the club with giving them some sweet tunes and some nice drinks, but like this person is saying, you know, who gets to get in and come out. And preservation to me is like, okay, this is like kind of back to the coelacanth thing. It's like, I'm going to preserve all the things that are su successful and not, you know, do anything crazy because I'm well fitted to my environment. But for, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's like natural selection is the, the environment we exist in and the environment within us selecting for us to be a certain way, not us selecting for anything to be at all. Um, we have no part to play in it. It's all whatever else happens around us, and we just hope it all works out. Um, and it's really not, I think the word preservation too. There are some instances where like a new mutation becomes the most advantageous. Yeah. And so you're not preserving what was already there. You really are selecting for something new. Sick burn, Audrey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then this is our, our last question for the day. Um, if gorillas are primarily herbivores, why do they have predatory features in their faces? Mainly centered vision, powerful jaws, and large canines. What's with that? And this is on our r slash ask science discussions. Um, so, you know, I can understand thinking that, right? Like we do associate predatory critters with you know, all of those features, but there is a lot of elements that, um, of evolution that people maybe don't think about, which is sexual selection. Um, gorillas have to compete to, to get it on. You know what I'm saying? Like they gotta, they gotta show up. So although these traits seem associated with carnivorous species, many traits serve purposes beyond diet. So, you know, gorillas are herbivores and they enjoy their, their lives eating plants only, but they also go through sexual selection with other um, other gorillas, right? So these features show potential mates that the gorilla is a favorable person to have sex with, similar to how you may want to have sex with somebody because they have great um, skills with playing the piano. So your children are great um, pianists, but this is kind of the same thing. It's like, if I, if I know my potential mate is healthy, 
is going to be able to provide for me and my offspring, then let's do this thing. And if that means that they have these not exactly carnivorous features, but that how this person is describing, then that's what it means. Um, it's not, not everything is linked to diet. Like not everything is linked. Like you think it is. I think there are a lot of things that kind of are a curveball. And there's also a lot of things that are left over from time beyond not saying that gorillas are this, this exactly, um, the example I'm looking for, but like plenty, plenty of critters on the earth have features that are left behind and haven't changed because there's no need to. Um, so even so, aside from sexual selection, any critter could have any feature that just hadn't had the energy to do away with it yet or select for or something. it could potentially be linked to something that was advantageous. So now, yeah. even though they're not using it because the genes are linked, it's just still being carried along for the ride. Yeah. But yeah, I do it's think that work we don't gotta. <laughs> I do think that like sexual selection sometimes doesn't get as much attention as it needs to. Um, when we're talking about evolution, there's a lot of animals. The whole point is to reproduce, right? So if you can't attract a mate. What's the point? Like those birds of paradise. They're gorgeous. All those fancy colors, all those like beautiful, weird little like things on their feathers. But that also makes it real easy for them to be spotted by anything that wants to eat them. Right? So if you might look at it, you might say like, that's not advantageous to be colorful in a forest that's just green because then you're so easily spotted but they still need to find a mate and their mates don't want a bird that's not colorful and not ornamented. Yeah. yeah. A lot of things are, are trade-offs, right? Like it's, it's all, like you said, it's not advantageous to be um, an easy target for other animals, but it is advantageous to um, be desirable. To have sex with. Oh, <laughs> oh he didn't that. like that. <laughs> he did no, not have a happy look on his face. Like <laughs> <laughs> he was coming to struggle with me, but he kind of likes when I just let him do his thing. Like I just exist as the chair and he mm-hmm. just lays in me. Like very cat. I am thing. only the furniture. <laughs> the end. But like Finny, my sweet child, like he probably has plenty of things that don't quite match his environment. Given, especially given that fat cats are not necessarily as domesticated as dogs are. My sweet man. But he's very handsome. Um, very smart. And it's because I am handsome and smart and I pass it on to him. My child. Um, <laughs> You gave him your talents. Yeah, I gave him. Yeah, oh, you should see him play the piano. He's very talented. Uh, we should see him read. He works a lot. Oh, can't we share a laptop? It's very hard for me. Uh, that's why I can't get any work done. That's what we'll tell our faculty. I'll show them the picture of him laying on the laptop. Oh, sorry, I couldn't. I had to. I had to share the resources in this. Sure that's why I can't write that paper. Yeah. Um. So, guys, uh, there you have it. That's our first episode. Our first real episode giving you the the facts and the info um on what the heck is going on with evolution yeah. what matters who cares who do we what do we do? um and on the on the subject of you know <laughs> what the fuck do we know um i'm going to be time stamping everything and you can you can follow some resources down below so you can make sure we're not liars and fakers. <laughs> um, so, and, and you can also read in your own time um, if you're also partially interested or, you know, don't care at all <laughs> and just ignore it. Um, so we will be coming at you live again soon. Uh, let's see what we have up next for you guys. The next episode will be survival of the illest. And I hope that you're, <laughs> not ill (laughs) by the time we get back to you about it. Um, So we will be dropping this soon and I hope to see you next time. Stay uh, stay, uh, stay healthy. Stay Stay out of the world too. Stay home. Yeah, do that. I've only been at home for a month, so y'all have to go home too because I can't (laughs) continue to look at people at spring break and feel jealous. So um, yeah. We'll see you later. Thanks. (laughs) Goodbye.